name is Taylor Bowie, and we're here at the Seattle Antiquarian Book Fair. It's Sunday, October 14th, 2012, and I'm sitting here with Elizabeth Svensson, who has a book business in Xenia, Ohio, called Walkabout Books. And uh, I don't know Elizabeth really well. We've only just met, and I'm very interested and anxious to hear about uh, her life and, and her time in the book trade and anything else she wants to talk about. So, Elizabeth, thank you very much for joining us here. And uh, welcome to Seattle, too. Is this Thanks. your first visit? No. Not. I am, I'm a big fan of this area. Oh, so I've been great. here many times. Well, good. We look forward to seeing you back at other times than the book fair, too. So, uh, just first, give us a little bit about your background, where you were born and raised, and maybe something about your education. Uh, I was born in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, raised a combination of New York City and Eastern Long Island. I had divorced parents, and I went back and forth, so I kind of lived uh, a country life and a city life at the same you live time. In Manhattan? Or yeah. Manhattan? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I went to Cornell University as an undergraduate. I was a history major. And then I went on to graduate school at Princeton, again, as a history major. Wow. And then, after a long time of doing that, I, um, I, I had done all my dissertation research and was at the point and had written some of my dissertation and decided I didn't want to do it anymore. What was your dissertation about? It was about um, radical religious movements on the um, Ohio frontier, which was then the frontier. Yes. We were talking yes. between 1790 and 1820, um, or a little later, origins of Mormonism and other um, original American religious groups that did not succeed the way Mormonism did. Were the Shakers? The, the Shakers way? were around oh, there. Yeah. yeah, and Disciples of Christ is oh, another one, yeah. Alexander Campbell. And then there are all sorts of uh, ones that nobody's ever heard of that anymore. Faded away yes, kind of. you know, you know yeah. people like the Leatherwood God, um, who William Dean Howells wrote a book called the, Le Le the Leatherwood God that sort of tells the story, and it's based on a real guy who had that Wow. What, that's how he was I'll known. Books. I don't think I've ever seen that one. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Wow. So, um, the, no, and I loved doing the research and mm -hmm. I loved the subject matter, but I realized I didn't want to be an academic. And that being the case, there really wasn't any reason to do the hard part of actually writing the dissertation. Did you get to the point where you were doing teaching at all? I did. I just taught one class. Uh -huh. um, what was that about? It was about... Um, the Atlantic world and the trade between Africa and the U.S. and Europe um, between about, uh, I don't even remember now, maybe 1700 to 1900. Um, it wasn't a class I designed. It was an American studies class. Um, slave trade. Slave, a lot of slave trade stuff, yeah. but also like um, uh, the South American um, revolutions yeah. and oh, all that right. kind of stuff. Wow. So. It was interesting. But sure. one day, well, probably not one day, you woke up, but over a period of time, you decided this was not the direction you wanted to go. Yeah, I really didn't like being in academia so much. Teaching would would have been okay, but the the and, whole well, academic. I, thing. I grew up with a parent in the English department here at the university, and yeah, there's the teaching, and then there's the department politics, right. yeah. and personality clashes. Yeah, that, that's the whole part I didn't yeah. much like. In Emotional Prin Princeton, crises. in particular, is not a very pleasant place uh, you know, to be. That's funny. I've heard from other people. Yeah. I, I'm beginning to believe it. That's yeah, a large number of my my uh, colleagues or you know other students in the same time period didn't finish, left also. Just I mean, yeah, good. people just chose not to yeah. subject themselves to it. Yeah, for you. pretty much. And then I went to more graduate school because oh. um, I had another interest that I decided to pursue. And what was that? Um, <laughs> criminal justice. I had, oh, I got a matter, master's. Better and better. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. Wow. I got a master's degree in criminal justice um, at Rutgers uh -huh. uh, while still living there. Um, so that's, that's the educational background. Well, then did you pursue a career related to your criminal justice? Eventually, yeah. And what did that involve? Well, um, <laughs> I, when I graduated, when I got the master's, I wanted to go into community-based crime prevention, which is just something. I actually went in interested in prisons and um, offender rehabilitation, uh -huh. but uh, I got more and more into I learned a lot about community policing and crime prevention through community organizations and stuff like that. Got interested in that and would have loved to get a job in it, but it's not something that there's, you know, jobs, oh. a lot of jobs in. And um, we, that was about the time I relocated to Ohio uh -huh. from New Jersey. 
and uh, what, what brought you to Ohio? My husband, I had gotten recently married. My husband is a native of Michigan and wanted to live closer to his family, but not necessarily right next to his yeah, family. I understand that. And yeah. so we were looking, both looking for jobs in the Indiana, Ohio, Michigan uh -huh. area. Um, and I was willing to come go to Ohio because I had done my dissertation research there and kind of liked it. Yeah. And I've always wanted a horse. That was the main <laughs> thing. And uh, growing up in New York City, I couldn't have didn't one. Didn't have one. And we couldn't afford to have land in where we were living in New Jersey and then Pennsylvania because it's just way too expensive. Yeah. And Ohio, we we live on 14 acres now. Oh. And you know we didn't have to spend a fortune to get it. And now I have a horse. So. What else do you have on the 14 acres? Uh, a lot of woods and two goats and six chickens nice. and some cats oh. and oh. trees. I'm not familiar. I, I think I might have been through Xenia. What what is it near? Dayton. Oh, oh, it is near Dayton. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have been very close there if I wasn't there at all. Yeah. Well, your husband and you lo relocated to Ohio. Right, and so I just started looking for jobs in the criminal justice field. I did some short-term jobs at a domestic violence agency. Um, uh, worked in a shelter in the shelter and worked as a legal advocate, but they were really I was really standing in for people. Um, and then a uh, job came up with the Ohio Adult Parole Authority, and I wanted a criminal justice job, so I thought, all right, well, let me see. It's kind of a combination of social work and law enforcement, and um, I had never planned to go into law enforcement. Never planned to carry a gun. I had never fired a gun in my life, uh, but this was a requirement for this job. To be on the parole authority. Yeah, yeah, because this is working with, it's, it's not probation, oh, it's parole. Okay. So parole. it's working right. with okay. felons who right. have been incarcerated, so they're relatively dangerous individuals. Yeah. Parole doesn't mean they're not guilty of whatever it was they did. No, no, it, it means they, they, I mean, some of them were murderers, the yeah. convicted murderers, and they've served their 20 year sentence or sex offenders, and then they're let out and they're supervised for whatever right. period of time. So, so if, from my experience watching movies, which is the closest I've gotten to this, you would have been called a parole officer? Yes. Okay. Also known as PO. Usually, <laughs> usually you're referred to, they, 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 they all refer to you as, your, as their PO. My PO. Yeah, my PO, yeah. Wow. Um, so I applied for that and I was hired. And, and what so, city was that in? Dayton. In Dayton. That was okay. the mean streets of Dayton, which are moderately mean. Are they really? Uh, yeah. There's a lot of crime there. And um, so... Uh, yeah, so I did that for a year. Um, Give me a point in the calendar. Where, where are we? What year would that be? We are 2002, two, two, three, okay. something like that. Yeah, not so long ago, yeah. 12, 10 years ago. Um, yeah, uh, I did that for a year. Um, I liked it very much. I really wasn't totally cut out for it because I'm not really that tough. Um, but I, I did enjoy the work. May I ask, did you ever have occasion to use your gun or to pull your gun out? Or? Uh, no, the furthest was uh, unsnapping the holster and hand on the gun, but I didn't have, well, I guess I did have occasion to pull it out when like searching a house, but there didn't turn out to be anybody there. But sometimes you, you want to be cautious, so, wow. but yeah. not, nothing, you know, really when you serious. Were, but When you were searching a house, were you accompanied by uh, a policeman? You know? No, I would have another, uh, uh, another yeah. parole officer yeah. or two with me. Wow. Um, if we had a planned search, we would call the police, but sometimes you got into situations where, for whatever reason, you didn't know something was going to occur and you needed to look around. Um, and in that case, you, you usually had a partner, though. At the end of the year, you were there, then what happened? Did you just quit? Or? This is a really long story. <laughs> Let's just say I, I, I had a disagreement with the state of Ohio. I understand. I did not appreciate. We had it, I, I mean, the, the short version is that we had an incident in which a, um, a, a guy escaped from custody. Um, he was handcuffed behind his back in a locked van and he managed to use his feet, he kicked off his shoes and used his bare feet and his toes to get the van window down and then squirmed his way out and ran off. Um, and <laughs> we got in trouble, which is fine. The three of us officers who were all rookies, we were all right. one year off, or two of us were a year and the other was six months, who were supposed to be, we had left him in the locked van because we thought he was secure and we were searching the house. Where he, so. We had found he had a gun and we were right. doing a search and anyway, we came back and he was gone, which is a big pit of your stomach dropping kind of horrible feeling. Can't even imagine. Um, he wasn't fortunately in a, a violent offender. He was, 
Well, he, he did, did have a gun. But, but he was very resourceful. Yes, very resourceful. Um, since long since sent back to prison. Yeah. But uh, anyway, it, there was an incident, and I would have been fine with you know being disciplined in some way and told I had longer probation or had to get extra training. But it, it turned into something very similar to uh, a prosecution oh, from our employers, and I I was didn't have the tolerance for the way we were being treated, and I had another I found another job, and so I decided to say bye bye. State of Ohio. What was the other job you found? Then I found a community-based crime prevention job working in a pilot domestic violence prevention program for the same agency that I had worked for previously. They had gotten a grant from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, oh. which was for the first time ever trying to treat domestic violence as a health epidemic and see if they could pr apply preventive measures, yeah. which is not something that really had ever been done. Um, and uh, so this is also Dayton. I think. It was in the county south of Dayton, okay. um, little town called Franklin, a kind of a working class. They, they, the the agency applied specifically to do this in Franklin because it had the highest rate of domestic violence okay. in the county. That, but it was still um, close to home, close to the farm. Yeah, it was, it was about a forty-minute commute. Yeah. But uh, well, how long did that job last? Also a year. <laughs> this is leading up to why I am a bookseller, partly. <laughs> um, Again, uh, after a year, I ran out of tolerance for the bureaucratic aspects of the situation. Um, I had people that I felt were not, people weren't coordinating and working together the way they ought to be, and I spoke up about it and suggested changes, and they didn't happen, and I got frustrated. So you quit. So I quit. So then I was working from home as a freelance um, writer and editor um, and to back up throughout graduate school I had you know added supplemented uh -huh. my income as an editor I've yeah. done that for years even in when I was in college I worked as a writing tutor and I worked as an editor freelance and so um, so I had been doing that and uh, once I had a criminal justice degree I was able to get criminal justice consulting work and writing on and working on criminal justice issues which was really really interesting where along in your background, I'm trying to figure it out, and maybe you're going to tell us next, but where was the exposure or where might you have gotten the idea even to go into the old and rare book business? Okay, well. I'm trying to. I'm trying to <laughs> we, know, we'll, we'll back up. Okay. Both we'll of back. my parents are English majors. Uh, I was raised with an absolute love and respect for books. Books were around the house. Oh, the house yeah. was full of books yeah. and, um, you, you know, I was read to from, you know, oh, like the yeah. moment I was born. Um, and growing up in New York City, there used to be a lot, a lot of used bookstores. There were probably five within easy walking distance of where I lived. Where, where did you live? On the Upper West Side, oh. near Columbia. Okay. Um, sure. So there were all these bookstores around Columbia, and, and I, I mean, I just loved books always, and used bookstores, were and when I was a teenager. Families? No. They weren't? No, the, um, my mother's a writer, uh -huh. uh, professionally, and my father kind of is now, but he was in radio when I was a kid. Um, I want to talk to you about that. And later. a magician. Oh, I definitely want to talk about him. Um, but anyway, so we, so I spent a lot of time when I was a teenager. I just, uh -huh. you know, I could walk and wander into used bookstores, and I was, I was, I constantly in used bookstores, and you know, just mostly buying paperback copies of the classics and stuff like that. Um, when you were making the rounds for the bookstores, did you at that time imagine yourself working? in a bookstore or in the book business? You yes, did. I imagined it. For, and, and, and I did it, in fact. there was This wasn't a used bookstore, but when I was 16, another my, one of my high school friends and I um, were offered a job, which we both took, in a local, independent, little, tiny little hole-in-the-wall bookstore that had all kinds of different, interesting, you know, cutting-edge kinds of lit and stuff like that. New, new books. New books. And we used to wander in there and look at the books and talk to each other and whisper and giggle. And the guy sitting behind the counter was watching us. And one day he said, you know, you young, young ladies seem like you're really interested in these books. And we said, yeah. And he said, you want a job? And we said, yeah. Now you were 16, uh, right? Yeah. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So, so I did that, you know, for a year or something in high school, and um, so yes, I always. So that was you know, way in the in the background. So yeah. then this second criminal justice job has ended. Yes. And then what happened? I'm working at home. I'm a okay. freelance yeah. writer, right. um, and I have, you know, not 40 hours a week worth of work. I've got time, yeah. and I've got two sets of graduate school books 
right? I've got all these books I've accumulated, actually almost three, because I left out the part where I switched fields in the middle of graduate school. So I started out um, history grad school in medieval and renaissance oh. and switched to American religious history <laughs> later on. And so I had all this medieval and renaissance stuff, all of this um, American religion and then criminal justice books and um, you know a lot of it I still own but there was plenty of stuff I didn't need, didn't need anymore. and I thought well let me see what happens and I threw some stuff up I started on Amazon and then I threw some and it's sold and for decent price much better prices than we now get I mean that that's yes. how the, the you know I've been with the internet the whole time right. but it was a lot better when yeah. I started I mean prices were much higher for things when you when you started with it you could still get a lot of money for things that yeah, for academic, practice, scholarly practice stuff. Practice sale. Right, right. So that went well. And then, of course, I immediately developed a taste for this and started buying stuff out in the world when I saw it and for resale. Sure. And then I opened an account with Abe mm -hmm. and made my first, you know, did my first database and the first upload and started. And it, people were buying stuff. <laughs> well, we, we've talked about your interest growing up. I mean, everything from used bookstores to... Uh, medieval history and uh, criminal justice, things like that. But your specialties, at least according to our book fair director, are mountaineering, travel, polar, and Alaskana. Now, yeah. you've got to explain to me now, how did you get led or how did you find a path to that? Um, well, so briefly from the, the online store that I started in 2004, mm -hmm. it went well. You know, it was good. I was making enough money to think that, hmm, yeah. I could maybe have a shop, especially because in Xenia, Ohio, rent is very cheap. And I was able to rent a 2,000 square foot space for $450 a month. Oh my goodness. Yes. Oh, <laughs> so why not? I mean, it was almost less than renting storage space because my I don't have a very big house and yeah. the books were taking over the house. And were you calling yourself Walkabout Books? No. Oh, not yet. No. Okay. This was Blue Jacket Books, Blue Jacket. which is okay. named after the local Shawnee warrior who oh. people know well in that area. Okay. And I, at the time, I actually was very interested in trying to do a lot of Ohio history, mm -hmm. and so I was trying to pick a local kind of a name. Um, and uh, so in 2006, I opened a brick and mortar shop in downtown Xenia. Um, yeah. You just and give me an idea how many people live in Xenia? 25,000. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it's, you know, there's other, there's mm -hmm. a lot, it's not like, that isolated and right, right. there's um, near other towns. Uh, yeah, it's near other towns. And and it also has two main two US highways cross oh, in it. So good. traffic comes through town yeah. and stuff like that. So two thousand um, square foot store, blue yeah. jacket books. Yeah. Sounds nice. Yeah. And um, so I it was basically a regular secondhand bookstore. Um, when you opened did you have enough inventory at the start to fill up your store comfortably or uh, semi. I, it, it wasn't that full. I mean, there were bookcases along all the walls, but there wasn't so much right. in the middle. It was fairly open. I probably had 10,000 books yeah. when I started. No, that's a big um, and, but as, as we all know, books come to you and it can, grows very easily. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I got, got more books. When you easily. started, did you have anyone helping you? Uh, no. An employee? Just no, you? but after maybe six months, I did hire one part-time employee. Yeah. And then I, ever after that, I always did have um, some part times, um, usually two people at once uh -huh. who helped. Um, and then in 2009, I went to the Colorado Antiquarian uh -huh. Book Seminar. Okay. Um, and because people had suggested it and everybody said it was great. And uh -huh. the more I dealt with older antiquarian books and more interesting books, the more I liked them. Um, and I wanted to know more, so off I went. Colorado and as with many people it pretty much changed my life. Um, I never yeah. had the privilege or pleasure to go to that but that's I've heard that yeah. so many times I believe it. Yeah it was one of the best weeks of my life. Who were some, some of the people you met at that seminar in 2009? Um, meaning faculty or just, students or both? People, people um, well, well faculty the, the people that I have remained most in contact with are Rob Rulon Miller and um, Greg Gibson. Uh, and students, um, Howard Prouty, yes, I'm very Howard fond of, right, and he, yes, and we were there at the same time. Um, those are the people who stick out in my yeah. mind the most as people that I, I met there. Well, I mean, I, I met 
Tom Congleton and Dan DeSimone and, and everybody was, you know, and Kevin Johnson and, every, and, and they're all incredibly Why didn't you Dan was uh, teaching that thing? Too. Yeah, That's yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. I was like, Dan, I haven't yeah. seen him in a long time. Wow, that's yeah. great. Um, what are some of the courses that you took that year? Or, or is that how they do it? Courses? It's not courses. No, I mean, or? it's sort of divided up into a couple of hours here we're going to talk about the, I mean everybody stays in the same room the whole time and the faculty I rotate see. through and okay. they each have their different subjects that they talk on so somebody will give a talk on scouting and somebody uh -huh. will give a talk on cataloging and somebody will give a talk on book fairs and somebody will talk about oh Michael Ginsburg was right. there too and he did the auction um, and so we would learn because a lot of us you know you, you had auctions can be scary if you've never been sure. to one and you don't know how it all works and I what you're supposed to do and, yeah and so there's a mock auction held nice. and they they do a catalog and and faculty and other locals donate items and yeah. usually bibliographies and sure. other book stuff book bags and right. things and then <laughs> so they run it Michael Ginsburg at the time would be the auctioneer and they would run it so that's another thing that goes on um, there, there was a uh, a class. Uh, oh, what well, Terry Bellinger was not there the year I oh, was there, but somebody else did hit what he normally does. So that's like the physical construction of books and um, you know collation, uh -huh. how to do collation, at least the basics of right. collational formulas and stuff. Because you just don't know about that when you're just like a guy you know, no. running running a bookstore. So all that. Um, but I had been, th the answer, the long answer here to, to how right. I got to walk about books is I had been thinking about specializing. Mm -hmm. um, and I talked to the faculty and I said, I'm kind of thinking about travel and exploration. And why? Because I love those books. Mm -hmm. Because I love to travel and I love to explore. I love to explore and I love books about p people going to unknown lands. So I also like Western Americana for the same reason. Because, I mean, at least not, not necessarily the outlaw part, but the, but the people go, you know, the pioneering spirit part, um, and uh, you know, the exploration of places people have never been and don't know what's going to be there, and and for that, and I was very interested then, and still am in um, Africa, African exploration, 19th century explorers, and South America, um, people going into the Amazon jungle, all that kind of stuff, and um, so I asked Rob, like. Should I do this? Yeah, can I? Yeah. And uh, because I was a little worried because it can be a quite an expensive specialty for one thing. But um, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, you should do this." I don't know if you, it was right or wrong, but that's what he said, and it kind of went from there. I started working on it. Now, did you meet Rob and Greg Gibson at the seminar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know Greg was there. Either. He was the year I was there. He was the guest. They always have a guest oh, specialist okay. dealer. Okay. And lucky me, because I'm also interested in maritime, maritime stuff, yeah. so I was, it was just really nice for me that he happened to be the person there that year. That is, that is great. Um, wow. So, and mountaineering actually was just, I love mountaineering books, oh. I've always, I love to read climbing books, I find them fascinating. And actually, I think I originally asked Rob, can I specialize in mountaineering, is this a good idea? And he said, well, that's a little too narrow, and you should do a little more than that. Of course, there are some specialists in it, but, right. you know, I'm, I'm of the mind that the broader ones outlook is the better it is and, right. and you have specific categories but within those categories there's a lot of room to uh, yeah you know to do things I, yeah. I like that yeah and I have other stuff in my what I now have a separate small shop and we can get to that but I have lit literature and um, well yeah, yeah let's let's talk about that uh, the, the original blue jacket books in the uh, 2,000 square feet how right. long I take it that's gone now no it is not oh, it isn't no oh, good I sold it oh and it, it's not it's gone from me, you, but it yeah. still carries well, on, which was great. very important to me. Well, that's um, amazing too to be able to sell an open people keep, shop. People keep saying that it's it's almost it's just exactly a year. It was like, I think it was October third uh -huh. of last year, two thousand eleven, that I uh, I, sell, I successfully managed to sell the open shop. But you'd um, already established this walk about no. the book. Oh, really? mm -hmm. oh, no, no, okay. that's this was the plan. This nice. is what I decided I wanted to do. I wanted to focus more. Oh. On antiquarian, and I wanted to have the time to sit and do the cataloging, yeah. and to be able to do more book fairs, and not right. be interrupted 20 times a day, and not have to be at the shop six days a week, and all that. Can kind I of change stuff. for a dollar? How do you get to the post office? Right, you know? right. And I, I really 
just wanted to work yeah. Yeah. on the books. And so that was why I decided that I would like to see if I could sell the shop. I definitely didn't. The, the shop had become a really nice community yeah. place. We had a lot of events and people like it and, and there's not that much going on in town. And so I really, really didn't want to close it. Um, and I guess I would still be there if I hadn't found a buyer, but you, you I were, did. You were, as much as you love the store, you were done with that. Yeah. It's the same thing people, you know, I closed my big shop in Seattle in 99, and people still say to me, do you miss the shop? I say, yeah, I miss the shop, but I don't miss running the shop. Right. And that's, uh, right. you hit the wall on yeah. that too, yeah. Yeah, Good and so uh, once, I, it was about, the purchase went through in October, but it was about June when we agreed we made an agreement. He had to come up with the yeah, financing. Yeah. So for the course of between June and October, I was gradually was getting a website designed. I had chosen the name after polling many, many book dealers. Um, uh, I, I think that's an excellent name for, well, for what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. That's yeah. what I was trying. I was trying to get something memorable that represented. I, I know the school to put the person's name on it, right. but if not, the name has to make sense. Right. You know, when I see something like battered volume bookstore, <laughs> you know, old tones or something. Well, that doesn't mean anything, but yeah. here, that, that leads you right into what you're dealing with. Right. That's excellent. Right. Uh, the, are you still kind of consulting with your... Yeah. Your, oh, that's good. Yeah, especially about where books are yeah. on the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> I can't find out. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's good. Well, I wish him well, and, and I hope that'll work out. Good yeah. for you for helping to... Yeah, and we work Maybe. together really well yeah. and refer people. And now sure. Xenia is like a book town. We've got yeah. two bookstores. Yeah, that's and, great. Yeah, you know, so. that is great. Uh, is most of your inventory listed online, one place or another? Um, most. most. Yeah, I mean, I maybe eighty yeah, percent. Yeah, that, like that. that's a lot. Yeah, and. My inventory being rather small because I sold almost all of it the and started inventory. rebuilding. Right. Um, yeah, I only kept the highest end books and everything else I sold to him. So I, I was back down to an inventory of when I when I first when Walkabout Books hit the web, it had 250 books, mm -hmm. um, and now I'm up to around 1,200. Well, that, well that's yeah. quite an increase, especially in you know kind of a narrow. Uh, but narrow. as I say, I've got other stuff yeah. because people still offer me collections that sure. are. So, I don't usually say no if there's you know decent modern literature or well, something like that. So yeah, there, there's no reason for any bookseller in any field to pass up an opportunity, right. even if it's just to pass them on to somebody else in the trade. I mean, you know, that's how we help each other out in one of the ways. Anyway, uh, so as I from the time frame with you, and you're one of the uh, kind of newer people in the trade that I've spoken with, and. When you started out, the internet was already an established fact yes. of the trade. It wasn't like something to fight, or it wasn't something to like or hate. It was just part of what was well, going on. I, actually, I really with. liked it because I had long been a used book online, used book buyer myself as a scholar. Yeah. You know, I mean, this was before pods. <laughs> so, so, so you recognize the advantages of it. Yeah. Do you find it uh, easier or difficult, more difficult to sell more expensive? nicer books online than say you would in person with somebody. I think harder to do it online. And it is, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Do you see some way in the future that can be made easier? Well, I think the fact that every, you know, pictures are now, I mean, that yeah. everybody's adding pictures and I certainly have become a big believer in pictures and and are, I try to illustrate right. every single thing and I, I definitely believe it helps a You lot. mentioned Tom Congleton whose business yeah. is between the covers and I don't know if you've seen or not, his pictures Oh, yeah, it's rotating 3D, yeah, they're wonderful. The first, first time I saw that, I just, my jaw dropped. I thought, boy, I expected the thing to pop right out at me so I could look at it. Yeah. Quite amazing. And it's great. I yeah. mean, yeah. Um, So you would certainly consider the development of the Internet a positive thing in the book trade overall? You know, it's really hard for me to speak to that, having not been in the book trade before the Internet. So I, it's, it's, for me, it's the way it works, you know, I just... What's your thoughts about book fairs? I love them. They're fun. <laughs> yeah. um, Do you see them as continuing to be an important part of your business in particular, yeah, or the trade I, in general? I think so. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's nothing to substitute the one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, you can call somebody on the phone or have a video conference. And there's nothing yeah. like. Yeah. I mean, especially with other dealers, yeah. I've oh, many yeah. times sold, sold dealers things at a fair 
that I had actually told them about or offered them sure. online and they're like, yeah, I don't need that. And then they came along and saw it in the booth and, and forgot that I'd ever offered it to I, them and they want it. But it's, yeah. it's fresh to them when you actually right. see it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a description is a description. Right. Cold, cold type. But, yeah. uh, so yes. How many book fairs do you do? In the course well, of I, I have greatly increased them since becoming walkabout books mm -hmm. because I have am able to so did six this year which is for me was wow. was a lot this where, is the six where one. were they Florida was first uh, -huh. uh New York Shadow Fair oh yeah how'd that go it was okay but to me it wasn't it didn't turn out to be is worth the amount of hassle still at the armory at 26th and Lexington yeah uh no oh. um 18th street I oh. forget what the building I used to do the ones at 26 and Lex. I, I like those yeah. fairs Everybody had told me it was fabulous, and maybe people had really like built up expectations yeah. too much. So it was okay, but I didn't love yeah, it. Yeah. Um, but my family's in New York, so it's, yeah. oh it's, sure, it, yeah, that your helps. Parents are uh, they're divorced, but, they're but my mother's in, in New York. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So I have a place to stay. Oh, that's good. And what, just um, real quickly, what are the other fairs you did this year? Uh, Buffalo. Yeah. Uh, just uh, just because I don't yeah. know, it was, I was encouraged to go. Yeah. It was fine. Um, uh, Twin Cities, yeah. which I've done for the second time. Yeah. Again, I wouldn't go all the way there if it weren't for the fact that I had a friend there that I like to see, but I actually did extremely well and was really oh, happy at the Twin really Cer well. Cities Fair this year. You're a rare um, bird in that one. I mean, everybody says they love to do it, but nobody says they do any business. I actually so did, and I, I hadn't done that much the year before, so I was surprised. But uh, We had such a great chat, and I got a little off track, but I'm yeah. glad this is what I wanted to do, was get okay. off track and, and let you talk. Uh, any plans to retire? No. Good. <laughs> Definitely not. Good. We'll just leave it at that. We will continue this conversation later. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. All right.